Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about air. Today's topic is going to be the greenhouse effect. So like always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain the greenhouse effect, compare and contrast various greenhouse gases, and discuss sources of greenhouse gases. So that's what we got. Let's go ahead and jump on in. So first thing, before we actually start talking about the greenhouse effect, I want to talk about the idea of global change and contrast that against global warming and climate change. So global change is just recognizing that things around the world change. Systems change, forests grow, forests are cut down, the water cycle runs, the rock cycle runs. You've got people building buildings. So our Earth is in a constant state of change. So you can talk about just global change and change in global systems. But we're going to drill down a little bit today into one specific system. And in doing so, we're going to talk about climate change, which is the idea that over time, the climate changes. Simple as that. Now, throughout history, we have seen that we've had ice ages, we've had warmer periods, we've had colder periods. So historically, we know that climates have changed. And for our purposes today, we're going to talk about climate change within the context that we now live. And I want you to recognize that while global warming is the thing that is most talked about right now, climate change is a broader category because right now on Earth we see some parts of the Earth warming much more quickly than other parts, like the Arctic and the Antarctic regions are warming up much more quickly than, say, the equator. There are some parts of the Earth that have actually showed a slight cooling trend over time. Um, this climate change idea also includes storms getting stronger. It includes rising of sea levels. So there's a lot that is wrapped into this term climate change. Know that global warming is not the only thing we're talking about when we talk about climate change. And forgive all the door noise in the background. So let's jump into the greenhouse effect. And this is going to be talking specifically about global warming, which is the Earth getting warmer, the climate, the atmosphere, all getting warmer. So in order to understand global warming, you have to be able to understand the greenhouse effect, which is the system that keeps the Earth at a stable temperature. And it's really just about as simple as that. We've got a blanket of gases wrapped around the Earth. They hold in heat. Without them, the Earth would not be habitable because it would be too cold or too hot, depending on whether it was night or day and which part of the sun you were pointed at or where you were at in your revolution on the Earth. So greenhouse effect is a necessary thing. And here's the nuts and bolts of how this kind of works out. I want to point out a couple things to you. So we've got our incoming solar radiation right here. This is where the energy comes in. Um, as I talked about in a previous video, radiation from the sun comes in multiple varieties. You've got high energy UV light. Now UV light doesn't impart any heat. It is just UV radiation. Then you've got the visible spectrum. And then you've got lower energy infrared energy and that infrared energy is what actually imparts heat so if you put your hand over the top of a stove and you feel heat coming off of that stove you're feeling infrared radiation so radiation comes in off of the sun the radiation that's coming off of the sun is too high in energy for the atmosphere to absorb it so it shoots through the atmosphere and then it heats up the surface of the earth best example of this I could give you is you walk out onto a sidewalk on a hot summer day and you burn your feet. That is because the surface of the earth is absorbing that radiation. After that radiation has been absorbed, it re-radiates that heat back out towards space at a lower energy. So it comes in high energy, it heats up the earth. That warm earth sends heat back out to space at a lower energy. That lower energy infrared radiation is trapped by greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases, it's not like they put a lid on things and just cap that heat in. The gases themselves heat up. And as they heat up, they impart that heat to the atmosphere. So radiation coming off the Earth's surface, it's absorbed by those greenhouse gases. And then the greenhouse gases, because they are warmer, warm up the atmosphere of the Earth. So that's kind of like nuts and bolts of the greenhouse effect. So forgive that edit that is now in there. Um, as is with the case of any system, this system has got inputs and outputs. So our input is the solar energy. The output is the energy that is re-radiated off of the surface of the Earth. If the inputs exceed the outputs, the Earth gets warmer. If the outputs exceed the inputs, the Earth gets colder. Presently, we are in a situation where the outputs do not exceed the inputs, so we are in a warming period. 
Now, greenhouse warming potential, we're going to start talking about the actual gases that trap heat. When we talk about greenhouse gases, we're talking about a specific category of gases that specifically grab that infrared radiation and heat up and warm the atmosphere. And they are compared according to their greenhouse warming potential, which is how much a molecule can contribute to global warming over a 100-year period. And they compare it to carbon dioxide, since that's the greenhouse gas that's always talked about. So we're just going to go down the line here. Water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, it's the one that is most responsible for our stable temperature, though its warming potential is very low because it doesn't last in the atmosphere very long. That water cycles through the water cycle, and it's in the atmosphere, and then it's back down as rain and part of a lake and back again. So while it is the most abundant greenhouse gas, it is certainly not the highest in warming potential. Get to carbon dioxide. That's the one you always hear about. Because it's the one we compare everything to, it has a warming potential of 1. Its abundance in the atmosphere right now is somewhere above 390 parts per million. So in a million molecules, there would be 390 of those molecules that are carbon dioxide. Um, they can last in the atmosphere from a year to hundreds of years. Next one up, and we are making a significant jump here, is methane. Methane is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It can hang out in the atmosphere for 12 years. Currently, its concentration is 1.8 parts per million. Because its concentration is so much lower, it does not contribute to global warming like carbon dioxide, though it is a stronger greenhouse gas. Then we're going to jump way up to nitrous oxide. This would be NO, 300 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. Current concentration, 0.3 parts per million, sticks around in the atmosphere for 114 years. And then the big daddy of them all, CFCs. Not only do they damage ozone and wreck the ozone layer and decrease the ozone layer, they are anywhere between 1,600 and 13,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide when it comes to warming potential. CFCs is a whole class of gases. So some of those gases are 1,600, some of them are 13,000. Currently, as a group, they're about 0.9 parts per million in the atmosphere, and they can last anywhere between 55 and 500 years. So they trap a lot of heat, and they stick around in the atmosphere for a long time. That's why they've got such a high warming potential. So with all that being said, saying that CFCs and methane and nitrous oxide are actually much stronger warming gases than carbon dioxide, why do we worry about carbon dioxide? The reason we do is because carbon dioxide is the most abundant human-emitted greenhouse gas. It's the one that we put the most of into the atmosphere, and that's through driving and energy generation and all those things that we've talked about that burn fossil fuels. So that's the one we look at. It's also the easiest to regulate because it is the most abundant. All right, we're going to wrap up here. Natural sources of greenhouse gases versus anthropogenic. So natural sources, things on Earth that give out greenhouse gases, include volcanic eruptions. When a volcano goes off, it puts tons of gases into the atmosphere from uh, your nitrous oxides to your sulfur oxides to carbon dioxide, water vapor. Volcanic eruption can put out a bunch of stuff. And know that when a volcano erupts, it can actually cause cooling of the global climate because the sun, the uh, particles that are in the atmosphere actually reflect sun back out to space like an umbrella. You got methane. Um, natural sources of methane is anaerobic decomposition. So this is organic material breaking down without oxygen around. Places we see this happening is in wetlands. They are the biggest emitter of natural greenhouse gas methane. Also, we see it from termites. Termites put out a tremendous amount of methane as they break down wood. And then you got cow farts. Cows graze or eat corn. That breaks down in their digestive tract, and they release methane. Nitrous oxide comes from the nitrogen cycle. There are bacteria in the cycle that take nitrogen out of the atmosphere. They break it down, and they release nitrous oxide as gas happens again in low oxygen areas. Last one is water vapor, and that's just simple water cycle evaporation. Now let's talk about anthropogenic. How do people put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? So we got fossil fuels. We've talked about them ad nauseum. As we burn things to run our lives, we release a ton of carbon. We also release a lot of black soot. Now the interesting thing about black soot is right now we've got a good thing going on with the ice caps in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Those things re uh, reflect radiation back out to space, helping to keep the Earth cooler. If those get covered over with black soot, they no longer reflect heat. Rather, that black soot absorbs heat and speeds the process of warming. Agriculture. Human agriculture releases a bunch of gases. So you got nitrogen, nitrous oxides that would be in the form of nitrogen fertilizers. So we put those fertilizers on the soil. 
as they decompose, they release nitrous oxide, got methane through decomposition of organic waste and our farming and cattle raising practices, and then carbon dioxide through decomposition in soil, through machinery used in the agriculture process, and transportation of food. Deforestation is a double whammy because one, those trees as they are standing, they can pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you cut them down, no longer are those trees pulling carbon dioxide. Also, a lot of deforestation involves burning the trees. So you cut it down, it's no longer taking in carbon dioxide. You burn it, any carbon that was stored in it is now released back out to the atmosphere and there's no tree to take it away because you've just cut it down and burnt it. You got your landfills, which would be back to that organic material decomposing under anaerobic conditions, releasing methane. And then we've got new greenhouse chemicals. All of the gases I've talked about so far are naturally occurring. CFCs are not naturally occurring. They are human manufactured. They are of our own creation. So the environment does not know what to do with them. So that comes from a lot of industrial sources, those refrigerants and the propellants and the things that we talked about the other day. So those would be the new greenhouse chemicals. And to finish up, I want to go ahead and jump on in and talk about some rankings of greenhouse gases and where they come from as far as like who is responsible for biggest emissions of which greenhouse gases. So you got the graphs right there on the side. Let's just talk through them real quick. As far as methane is concerned, livestock is the greatest emitter of methane gases. That's going to be livestock just going through their normal process of eating, digesting, and releasing flatulence. Underneath livestock, closely following them is landfills like we talked about in the previous slide, and then natural gas and petroleum drilling. So fracking, which we'll talk about in class, releases methane into the atmosphere, as does drilling for oil. So know that those are your big emitters of methane. For nitrous oxide, far and away the biggest emitter of nitrous oxide is agricultural soil. So like I talked about earlier, spread those nitrogen-containing fertilizers over the soil. As they break down, they release nitrous oxide. And then the last one, carbon dioxide, far and away. You can see there carbon dioxide percentage, fossil fuels not used for energy is like two and a half percent. Ninety-four percent of carbon dioxide emissions come from fossil fuels used for energy and that could be energy for transportation, electricity generation, industrial processes, whatever. So carbon dioxide, ninety-four percent of it comes from using fossil fuels for energy and I think finally that is it. Sorry for all of the edits and interruption and noise and everything else but thank you for joining us on the Lab 207.